Okay. Well, then let's get started, everybody. Um, see, we've got a good group already. Um, I'm happy to welcome each of you to the fifth installment in our Washington State University, Oregon State University Tree Fruit Extension webinar series. Uh, I'm Matthew Whiting, and, and I am introducing uh, our speaker today on behalf of my co-organizers and co-hosts, Ashley Thompson, who's with Oregon State University, and Bernadita Salato, who's also with Washington State University, both as tree fruit extension specialists. Bernadita is with me uh, today, and she will be um, working in the background to make sure that we don't have any issues with the audio and distribution, and she's also going to coordinate the Q&A session. So this is the fifth session of our series, which began earlier this year, and we are delighted to have uh, a special guest speaker, uh, Stavros Wigiokas, is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at, at UC Davis. Um, and we are delighted to have him speaking about uh, a topic that, that he has specialized in in, um, in the last, uh, in his tenure at uh, Davis. And that is looking at co-robotic harvest aid platforms and how they can affect harvesting speed. Okay, so good morning again, everybody. My name is Stavros Vujukas. I'm an associate professor at UC Davis. Uh, the topic today is co-robotic harvest aid platforms and, and how they can increase harvesting speed. The work I'm presenting is uh, uh, a lot of work done by uh, Zheng Haofei, Dr. Zheng Haofei now. He's a postdoctoral scholar with my lab, but he did his uh, PhD thesis with me. Um, and just as a brief introduction, I'm the director of the Bioautomation Lab. We do a lot of uh, different things. We work a lot on robotic harvest aids for strawberries, table grapes, and tree fruits. Uh, we also work on mechanical mass harvesting and robotic harvesting, autonomous navigation in orchards, as well as technologies to uh, collect data from people doing manual harvesting and also some post-harvest automation. But today's topic is gonna be uh, orchard platforms. So, um, you know, usually I, I spend quite some time introducing the problem, but I, I presume that for this audience, this is not really necessary. Uh, uh, many of you are growers, uh, you're all uh, involved in the industry, you know the problems. Um, a lot of fresh market fruit is picked manually um, our, our pickers use tall ladders and bags, and this is a very labor intensive um, operation. It's risky, it's very inefficient, moving ladders around, going up and down, walking to the bins. Uh, and of course, labor is becoming more and more scarce these days. So it's a matter of cost, production risk, all of those issues, uh, you are well aware of them. Uh, so I'm going to present results from a, a federally funded project that uh, I was directing uh, under the National Robotics Initiative. And uh, uh, the, uh, the collaborating institute was Carnegie Mellon. Uh, UC Davis was the leading institute in this effort. So ladders and, and manual picking. Um, you know, of course you are all aware that uh, we can use uh, machines that are harvest aid machines, orchard platforms to harvest trees as long as the trees are properly uh, um, maintained and they have the right shape, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, these platforms basically eliminate ladders and they eliminate walking. And usually we have four to six people peak on a platform. The platforms have multi-level decks so people harvest at different preset heights. Now, uh, let's talk about that now. We call this fixed zone harvesting because when pickers stand at preset heights, like you see here, up and down, um, that means that each picker essentially harvests inside the fixed canopy zone. So for example, uh, uh, this picker, the top picker harvests in this zone and the bottom picker harvests in this zone. And the two zones, of course, overlap also. It really depends on how the grower sets the heights. 
Now, I would like to ask you if you see a problem, you know, can, can zone harvesting, fixed zone harvesting be a problem for, uh, for the process? And I'm gonna launch a poll and I want you to answer yes, no, or I'm not sure. So let's see what people think. Is, is fixed zone harvesting potentially a problem? I think we have enough votes and let's share the results with you. So about 60% of the people think that this is a problem. 17% uh, say, well, not, not really a problem. And then 26% say, I'm not sure. So let's see what, uh, what's going on here, what is involved. So let's see some of the issues with zone harvesting. First of all, fruit distributions, as you know, are not uniform. And they also vary along the same row and among different rows. What I show you here is a very small example uh, of you know, uh, a few uh, meters of uh, the fruit distribution in an apple orchard. This is a vitrellis Fuji apple orchard in Lodi. And you can see that you know, there is more density of fruit with a dark color, lighter color is less, smaller density, less fruit. You can see here that there is a, you know, uh, not a lot of fruit here, but much more fruit here, but also this can vary change from top to bottom. So let's keep this in mind that the fruit distribution is not uniform. However, also our pickers on the platform have different picking speeds. And you know, inherently, somebody is more experienced than somebody else. Um, also, their picking speeds may vary over time because of fatigue or, or other reasons. And so, what happens is that think of the platform moving along the row, and think of the incoming fruits as the demand for labor, and the pickers' picking speeds being the labor supply. So we have labor demand, the more fruit there is inside the zone, the bigger the demand for labor, and the, the, the bigger the picking speed of the picker, the greater the labor supply in that zone. Now what happens is that when you have fixed zone harvesting, very often there is a mismatch between labor demand and labor supply in each zone. So there may be much more fruit here and less fruit here. And actually in a bad situation, the picker here may be a slower picker and the picker here could be a faster picker. That means that there is an imbalance that causes pickers idle times and effectively reduces the machine's harvesting speed. So this is issue number one. Is it a big deal? Well, we'll show some results later, but already from literature, we can see that uh, differences of up to 22% in picking efficiency have been recorded uh, from between the top and the bottom picker in some experiments that were done a few decades ago. So this can be a big number. It's not really one or 2%. Issue number two, in most orchard platforms, uh, the, the speed control is manual and what we do know is that the platform speed should match the fruit load and the picker speeds. And I will draw something here. Imagine that you have the picking platform's speed over here. So here is on the horizontal axis, the, the speed of the platform and the vertical axis is the throughput, how fast we pick. Now, if we do a mental experiment, if we are moving extremely slowly, or if we are moving, not even moving, the throughput, the picking speed is very low because we are not picking anymore. You know, we're not visiting areas with more fruit fast enough. As we speed up, the throughput increases. Now go on the other side. If you are moving extremely fast, the pickers don't even have the time to pick the fruit. So the throughput is really very small. As you slow down, it goes up it turns out that there is some sweet spot where your speed is optimal. You're harvesting the most that you can per unit of time. Well, the problem is that this speed really depends on the picking speed of the pickers and the fruit load. 
and on existing platforms, speed control is manual, as I said, typically adjusted intermittently by the front picker. As a result, the picker wastes time not picking and speed control is imperfect. So the second issue is manual speed control reduces the machine's harvesting speed. So we have two problems. One is the mismatch uh, uh, in the zone harvesting between picking speed and fruit load. And the other is the mismatch or non-optimal operational point of the platform in terms of speed. Now this project that we embarked on, the goal was to build a better core robotic harvest aid platform. And why is it core robotic? You will see exactly why. Um, the, uh, the figure here shows you what this platform looks like. And I will show you, of course, pictures. This is your standard platform. These are two lifts that we retrofitted so that they can independently go up and down. Two pickers are on, on the lifts. There is a camera in the front of the platform. And so the idea here is that this 3D camera builds a fruit map in real time. This heat map that you are seeing here is actually a density map of the fruits. Maybe there is more fruit here, there is less fruit here. The camera knows, the system gives that information to us. Also, there is a computer that controls the height of each lift. So the computer is lifting and lowering the pickers independently up and down in a way that matches the picker speed to the fruit load. Finally, the computer also optimizes the travel speed. So it, it, it causes the platform to move faster or slower automatically based on fruit load and picker speeds. So this is a nice diagram. How did we actually implement it? This shows you the system overview, the architecture. Uh, this is the platform again. Uh, there is a stereo camera provided by CMU. This is a special one that, uh, that can detect fruits in direct sunlight, but it's not really necessary. Uh, but again, we have a 3D camera that outputs a fruit map density. We also have an RTK GPS to uh, uh, locate the fruits and the platform. How do we measure picking speeds? Well, uh, in this platform, because picking is done manually in picking bags, what we did is we uh, instrumented some standard commercial uh, picking baskets or picking bags for apples. You can see here a box of electronics it has load cells and other equipment. So it measures, we measure in real time, the weight of the bag. And so we know every single time, every, every you know, tenth of a second, how fast this person is speaking. So this information, the fruit map, the position, the picking speed enters our software. This is an optimizing controller that takes all of this into consideration and creates an optimal uh, command for the lifts to go up or to go down and for the platform to move faster or slower. This is all done automatically. This is uh, a, a picture of the platform is actually a retrofitted banded express by automated ag. And what you see here is this is one hydraulic cylinder we installed to lift it up or down. This was an older model of the Bandit Express. Uh, this is a second cylinder. So this cylinder moves this lift up and down. This cylinder moves this lift up and down. Uh, this is the 3D camera. This is the GPS unit. And these are the picking bags of the pickers. This is myself and this is uh, Zenkhao. And this picture was taken in, in California in Lodi uh, last summer. So let me talk about experiments. We uh, built this platform. We went to a commercial apple orchard with vitrellist uh, Fuji trees um, in Lodi. And we had two pickers harvesting from one side of the platform. This platform could actually accommodate four pickers, 
but because of budgetary constraints, we only robotized one half of the platform. So we were harvesting only from the right side of the platform. What was the experiments? So we were operating in two different modes. One was what we call the full code robotic mode where the computer controls everything. And the other is the conventional mode where the human, the front picker controls the speed and the heights are fixed. The grower selected the heights based on his experience and, and, and the, and the uh, settings he used for his commercial picking. Um, we harvested about 2000 kilograms of uh, apples in this mode and then about 1,400 kilograms uh, of apples in the conventional mode. Overall, we harvested about three tons of apples in a total of uh, uh, five days. Uh, we also did two types of picking. One was with clipping stems and the other was without clipping stems. So this is a video of the orchard platform in operation. And what you see here, this is the, uh, a version of the 3D camera. Here I'm at, a, I'm at a, a spot in the orchard row where there is a gap. So that's why I can film it. This machine is very close to the uh, trees. You can see the front lift being operated going down right now. The computer is controlling this lift and it controls it based on the information by the camera and on the information by the picking bags that you can't really see here because that person is uh, behind the canopy. Uh, you can see the lift going up. Again, this is controlled by the computer. And now you can see the second cylinder and the second picker in the back. So as the platform moves forward at a speed of about you know, half or one inch per second, uh, these guys are picking the way they used to pick. They don't do anything differently, they just pick. Uh, but again, these heights, these lifts are controlled not by the pickers, uh, but by the computer. Uh, if it was up to the pickers, then they would waste a lot of time controlling the lifts, but also they, they would try to do the best for themselves, but not for the machine. Uh, and so again, this is, uh, this is part of the video. Let's see the results. So this is a table that shows uh, some of the results uh, in uh, here we have harvesting, I'm sorry, with clipping stems. Here we have no clipping. Uh, this is conventional mode. This is your standard uh, fixed height harvesting. This is the co robotic mode. And this is the ratio between the two. Uh, the performance measure is how many kilograms of fruit we pick per hour. This is the rear picker, this is the front picker, and this is the total speed of the machine. So this is the harvesting throughput of the machine. What, what's interesting to see here is that when the pickers were clipping stems, the, uh, the harvesting speeds were very different. The front picker was harvesting about 190 kilograms per hour. The rear picker was harvesting 280. This is in conventional mode. Now, when we went to co-robotic mode, where the computer took care of the speed and the lifts, you can see that there is still a difference between them, but it has been smoothed out. So this is about 1.4 times as much as this. This is 1.2 times as much as this. And this is also reflected, this workload balancing is reflected in the total speed. It went up from 235 to 260. That's 11% difference. It's 11% faster. Now, when we went to no clipping, which is of course faster in general, we noticed that these pickers uh, were harvesting at the same speeds, about 400 kilograms per hour. But in core robotic mode, they went up to 500 kilograms per hour. The pickers were the same here and here, but also here and here, nothing changed. The only difference is that now the computer controls the lifts and the speed, 
the uh, performance increase was 26%. This is significant. So what are our main conclusions? Intelligent control of the travel speed of the platform and the uh, picker lift heights can actually increase the harvesting speed of the entire machine significantly by doing load balancing between the pickers. The main ideas here, the take home messages is that picker workload balancing is needed. And then also platform speed adaptation is also needed. Those two things are very difficult to do manually. A computer needs to do them and can do them. Now this technology is applicable on, on platforms, of course, with lifts. Uh, but it could be also applied to platforms that have vacuum fruit conveyance systems like this uh, because, you know, they are, they, they are picking manually again. We would be controlling the lifts. The only difference is that we would need to measure the picking speeds by measuring how many fruits are going in the vacuum system by each worker. So it's really not a, not a big difference. The other important aspect is that this technology is applicable, but also necessary for future multi-arm robotic harvesters. Because a multi-arm harvester, again, is, is a set of pickers. They just happen to be uh, consistent. They don't have different speeds. Uh, but you still need to load balance the robots and also control the speed of the, of the platform. So we see this technology as being applicable to uh, other areas also. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge my uh, students and researchers in the lab, my lab R&D engineer, uh, our funding agency, and Jeff Colombini, the grower that uh, hosted us uh, in his orchard for multiple years. Uh, I would like to stop now, and I'm you know, happy to take any questions that you, you may uh, have. Thank you, Stavros. That's an uh, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, here we have one question. Uh, were you able to taste out how much of the improvement with co-robotic control was due to travel speed control versus platform height control? That's an excellent question. Uh, actually, we first implemented only lift control and tested it in one year, and then the other year we did both. Uh, it seems that speed control made a big difference versus lift control, but we don't have enough experimental data to you know, uh, solidly say, do this rather than that. Combined, it was very good. Uh, only lift control, it can be, I mean, we, we got up to like 11% of difference that year. We never reached the 26 that we saw with the speed and the lift control. So that's the only answer I can give now. Intuitively, it seems that the speed control may be more important consistently rather than the lift height control. Technically, would it does it make sense to just uh, focus on just the speed or just the platform height or, or really the technology is very simple to have them in, in combined? I think that the cheapest thing to do would be to focus on speed control because you don't need to retrofit the platform or install hydraulic lifts if they are not there. So even, uh, even having an adaptive cruise control system on the platform that's based on uh, picker speeds and fruit load, uh, I think that would be my first choice if I were to implement something at low cost, expecting the, the highest benefit. Um, can you estimate uh, kind of the difference or how it compares with the complete robotics? Yes, so of course, a robotic harvester is a different machine because you know you don't have people, you have robots. Uh, but as far as this technology is concerned, there's not much difference because you can think of a robot as a picker that's consistent in, in their picking speed. So if you have five robots on the platform, they all have inherently the same picking capacity. Whereas if you have five pickers, 
their capacity is not constant and it varies. Apart from that, if you, know, if you have a multi-robot arm harvester, you have to carefully tune the speed and do it adaptively. Otherwise, some of your arms will be underutilized. Um, we do have a current project that's federally funded on how can you program the arms how can you schedule their, their, their picking actions so that you maximize the, the picking speed of the machine? Remember, uh, a multi-robot arm, multi-arm robot harvester uh, costs a lot of money per arm. I mean, they're expensive. Uh, and you really want to squeeze out the most that you can out of its arm. So the topic of programming the machine not to underutilize arms and also to move at an optimal speed based on the number of arms you have is critical. So we see this, this technology as being very relevant to, to such machines. And, and as I said, we're actually embarking on building such a machine mainly to study this phenomenon, the, the, the load balancing. I mean, ideally, if, if the crop load is uniform, and the employees work the same with the same speed, you don't even need the complicated speed control. Uh, but, but this will never be the case. You know, you can never have uniform crop load, uh, you know, and, and it also costs, the, the more do you invest in, in your thinning and, and, and your other operations, of course, the cost goes up, uh, but there are some aspects that you can't control. So fruit load will always be non-uniform. It really, it's a complex phenomenon. And motivated employees, definitely that helps. I think most of them are because they, you know, they, they are paid by, by the bin uh, and, and there are crew dynamics. So if somebody is slacking or is very uh, uh, slow, they will be kicked out essentially. Um, but again, having said that there is always imbalance and with the, uh, with the crisis we have with labor, we can't really be extremely picky. So sometimes or often we get crews that are not optimally balanced, you know. Elvis, I know it wasn't an intention of your research, but did, did you generate also some data with those pickers on how fast they were with a standard approach? No platform, just a ladders and a picking bags. No, we didn't because uh, that grower doesn't use uh, ladders anymore. He, yeah. But he has a fleet of uh, uh, harvest aid platforms, more than 12. And according to him, he saw a 40% uh, difference in uh, picking speed in efficiency uh, with respect to the ladders. So, right. you know, this is anecdotal, but, you know, he's a businessman. Yeah. The fact that he bought 12 of them speaks to the data. I think he got really, really higher performance. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Yeah, that's that's that sounds exceptionally good. Forty percent uh, improvement with the platforms. And I think I think many growers around the world are looking at those same questions about transitioning to more uh, automation and the various steps of of accomplishing that, um, which I think makes your work so uh, so relevant and so exciting. Um, I, I I imagine that JJ at, uh, at Automated Ag and the others would be very keen um, to integrate some of these. Uh, some of these kinds of technologies. Have you had some some discussion about what are the next steps, even towards commercialization, uh, commercialization and, and integration into these existing platforms? So but you are right. Actually, JJ might be in the audience today. I sent him an invitation. Um, there is some interest locally from um, California uh, because you know people in this business realize that load balancing uh, and speed control are very important. Right. Um, so far, we haven't, you know, entered any agreement or, or uh, any commercialization effort, but I'm, I'm certainly open and looking forward to that. There is interest, but of course, the issue is always the cost and, you know, how you can incorporate the technology. Uh, right. But I think that um, if you start with speed control, because you also need the camera to do the speed control, the added benefits is that you automatically get yield maps, at least of the visible fruit, right? right? And the picking bags also give you ground truth, like how much fruit is there? And we have actually generated yield maps for those apple trees yeah. uh, from the rows that we harvested. Um, so there, there, there are side benefits to, to such technology. 
I see one question about the instrumented picking bags. Uh, yes, we, we could build a profile for each worker. Uh, and, and from the data we have, we know exactly how long it takes them to fill a bag uh, for every bag that they fill. We have very high resolution data. Uh, the picking bags are not expensive. They're, they're a few hundred dollars because the, the electronics and everything are cheap. What was expensive was the salaries of the researchers and the postdocs doing the development. Um, you know, we, we haven't really commercialized or gone into this effort about the picking bags, uh, but we have tested them repeatedly for three years and they, they worked very well. Uh, they log the data uh, inside uh, uh, an SD card, and they also transmit it wirelessly to the to the platform computer. So there, there, there is a ton of data that could be coming out and is coming out of these systems in terms of uh, yield mapping from picking bags, but also yield mapping from the cameras, uh, labor productivity. Uh, but you know, there are you know there are different directions, but you know. We haven't really explored them because it takes resources. Well, I just wanted to add a comment, and this is from a, a research that you did, Matthew, uh, in Cherries. That I, what I found very interesting that you show is that the best, uh, the biggest benefit you observed in the the teacher that wasn't as fast and probably as skilled as the other one uh, in terms of the clipping. So that was kind of the big, very big jump that you see by using the technology. And I think it's similar to something that Matthew have shown uh, with the technology that you help the bigger jump, you make it for those that are not uh, the most skilled uh, speakers, which is something that we are facing in the industry when we have people that are not um, from here that, that we have to replace every year the H to A program, so not all the teachers are are as skilled as we would like. That, that that's a very good comment. That's why I'm showing again this slide. You can see 190 versus 280. This is a huge difference. Uh, what we also noticed, and we were told that some pickers actually don't clip when they're supposed to because it slows them down. So that that affects also. <laughs> <laughs> the, the harvested crop, uh, but you know, not everybody is trained and fast enough to do the clipping um, adequately. Yeah, there's another question about the cost, of course. Uh, do you have an estimate of the how much cost. it will cost? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It really depends. Uh, this was a prototype. Uh, so if you are going to install new hydraulics and retrofit, I mean, that's I, I wouldn't expect that cost to be very high because hydraulics are not that expensive. Uh, so this is a manufacturer's thing. Uh, you know, we, we did all of this in our shop and it's difficult to estimate the actual cost. Now, in terms of the camera, if you use a, you know, a 3D camera, like a, a, an off the shelf camera, that would be $400 or so. So the camera is not very expensive. Um, the software, of course, um, it, it depends on how, how much it will cost to develop it. Um, and, and the picking bags, you know, our cost is a few hundred dollars. So, uh, of course, you, it, it is nice to have an RTK GPS on the platform uh, because it's giving you detailed information, precision about position, and it makes it easy and accurate to build the fruit map. Um, there are other ways to localize the platform inside the row based on vision, and we are working on those. But overall, uh, you know, we use the cheap GPS uh, with real time uh, over the network corrections. That's like $2,000. So overall, the sensor package and the soft, the sensor package is about, I would say, three, $4,000. Uh, and then the software is running on top of that. So it's not very expensive, but again, you know, if it's offered as an add-on to a commercial platform, I don't know what the cost would be because this would need to be a, a robust bulletproof product. And there is a lot of cost involved in, in assuring that. Okay, terrific. 
it looks like there are no further questions. So Stavros, let me, on behalf of our, of our group here and of all the attendees who cannot uh, join in and, and say thank you very much, uh, I'm sure we'll give you a, a virtual hand clap here. And uh, one, wonderful presentation. We thank you so much for being willing to, to join our webinar series and share this exciting work that you're doing uh, in California. And we look forward to keeping up with, uh, with the latest developments. You, you, you caught my interest with a number of the th issues that you said that you're working on currently that you didn't have time to get into today. So I hope, uh, wish you the best of luck with, uh, with uh, the remainder of this uh, research season. Um, wish the growers who are connected here and are still picking apples, I wish them uh, uh, a great harvest in the, in, the, in the last few weeks of the season here as well. And we look forward to connecting with, with everybody at a later date when we announce what our sixth uh, webinar series uh, subject matter will be. But thanks so much, uh, Stavros. Excellent presentation. We really appreciate your participation. Thank you, Matt. Thank, Thank you, Bernandita. Uh, it was uh, delightful to you know, present to you and thanks to the audience for being with us. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank